Welcome to the Consumer Rundown Podcast, your destination for the people, companies, and trends transforming today's consumer markets. We are your hosts. I'm Penny. And I'm Dimitri. On today's episode, we talk to Will Nitsa, the founder of IQ Bar. We learn how Will launched a nutrition bar that's good for your body and brain, how he leveraged his school network to raise money, and his long-term vision for IQ Bar. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Will. Can you please start off by just introducing IQ Bar in your own words? What are you trying to create and what drove you to create it? What we're trying to create, and I would argue have created to, to a pretty decent degree, is the first brain and body nutrition companies. We started in bars, but now we're platformizing ourselves and expanding into hydration and uh, a few other categories. And the goal is to kind of own that brain and body nutrition space. What does it mean to be a brain and body nutrition company? And what makes IQ Bar different? It just means that, you know, we're trying to displace things that don't serve the brain and body well from a energy con, you know, energy standpoint, a health standpoint, a longevity standpoint. I'm trying to displace that with things that are nutrient dense and functional in the sense that they, they do serve the body in all those respects and brain in all those respects. And certainly there, there's a zillion products that, that do that from the body standpoint, you know, protein bars, diet bars, mm-hmm. non bars, things yeah. that are high in fiber, et cetera, et cetera. Really, there was really nothing that did that on, on the brain front uh, until we came around. That's super interesting. What are the functional benefits of IQ bar? I think of consumer products in a feedback loop context. So either it has no feedback loop, so it's dead neutral, which virtually nothing is, but let's say let's say that's possible. You know, you consume something and your body has no physiological reaction to it. Then there's a positive feedback loop. So I drink a Red Bull and that's a stimulant. My heart rate goes up. Uh, I have a euphoric sense, psychological uh, effect. And then literally I can get addicted to that, right? Because there's caffeine, it's a drug, and I, I, want, I want that same thing tomorrow. It's a positive feedback loop. And there's a negative feedback loop, which is like I eat a slice of pizza for lunch. And then I feel lethargic and terrible two hours later. (laughs) Then there's the world we live in, which, which I would call the absence of a negative feedback loop world. Basically, instead of eating that pizza, you eat an IQ bar, which would be, which would cause you not to feel bad, basically cause you to feel good and, and like yourself and not lethargic. So there are nutrients in our products that are good for your brain, vitamin E strengthens uh, neuron cell membranes. You know, lion's mane helps you grow new neurons. There's a whole host of things that are good for your brain. You're not necessarily going to sense those physiologically speaking. You're not going to get a, a feedback loop physiologically speaking, but you just know they're, they're healthy. Like an analog would be omega-3 fatty acids or fish oil, right? You take it, you don't get a feedback loop. You just know mm-hmm. it's good for, good for your brain and you have the absence of a, of a negative feedback loop. That's that's super interesting because I think that's a problem with supplements. That feedback loop might take a long time for you to realize. And so how do you know if what you're doing is actually working? And some supplements you do get kind of that short-term feedback loop. I take ashwagandha and sometimes I notice like a change in my mood or whatever. I also take nootropics. You could definitely tell sometimes, you know, get a short-term kind of energy stimulant. But then other times you, I'm taking things like vitamin D and B and folic acid. And I always wonder, like, how do you know, like, how do I know that this is doing what it's supposed to do? How do you kind of uh, approach that with trying to measure what that actually is doing or like, communicating those benefits what you can do is you can you know educate people right a a similar phenomenon is protein tons of people put protein powder in in a shake or in their coffee or whatever Uh and they consume it is that doing something for them i mean yes it is to a degree they're probably over consuming it by like two three x in most cases And, and candidly that's why i like food because food has an inherent food or beverage have inherent value propositions they make you not hungry <laughs> or not thirsty. So they are serving a purpose. You're getting something for, for that. That's a great point, Will. How did you get interested in nutrition and the brain food world in general? I read a book that totally blew my mind called Grain Brain. And that was what really kick, kicked it off for me. And basically it was this guy, David Perlmutter, was looking at 
how does me eating a slice of pizza affect my brain today versus me eating avocado, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then also, let's say I eat pizza for 30, 40 years. Well, then yeah. what happens to my brain? Right. So short term and a long term yeah. uh, perspective. And of course, if you eat a high carb diet, constantly spiking your blood glucose, thus causing your body to spike insulin production, thus causing inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. The counter to that would be consuming products that are functional in the opposite way. They uh, scavenge and deactivate free radicals in your body and thus reducing inflammation. And uh, they help you grow new neurons. They help with neuroplasticity. You know, you help your brain literally change shape for the better. That book really kicked, kicked things off for me. And then I just kind of kept reading more and more and more and more books, but there aren't that many longitudinal studies on nutrition as it relates to the brain. That's very interesting. Not having a nutrition background, how did you approach formulation? And were you optimizing more for trendy ingredients or mainstream ingredients? Over time, you want to create things that are more and more mass market because you want to achieve more and more mass market penetration. No one gives a hoot about ashwagandha in mass market channels. And even the people that do give a hoot about it today very likely won't in a year. It doesn't mean you can't have ashwagandha in your product. In fact, maybe it's a good idea because you're appealing to that niche that does care. Question is, how do you, you're not going to be able to scale that to the mass market. So you're going to need something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and frankly, it might hurt you for the mass market. Mm. So what might, might help you in, in, in the smaller market might hurt you in the larger market. And by the way, the same principle applies to even like flavor titles. So we, our first three bars were cacao, almond, sea salt, blueberry, sunflower, walnut, wow. matcha, yeah. chai, hazelnut, right? Like kind of esoteric, like really yeah. like match like something you would poetic get at, like, your, names. Yeah. The farmer's market or whatever. Turns out the mass market does not want that. Now, what is it? Chocolate, sea salt, wild blueberry, matcha, chai. Kind of what I learned is you don't want to over innovate. You want to innovate. Basically, you want to meet the consumer where they are in nine, mm -hmm. out, of 10, nine out of 10 fields. And then you want to like, innovate on that 10th field. Don't want to innovate on, you know, maybe you can innovate on nine and 10. Maybe if you try and innovate on eight, nine, 10, you lost, like you've lost, there's too many objections uh, that, that can kind of lose you that sale. That makes sense. I, I do see that almost all your bars, maybe all of them have lion's mane extract. Is that, yeah. do you feel like that's a more, mainstream one is that why you've decided to go with kind of adding that in everything it's not that mainstream candidly right um so i i would say that that's fairly esoteric that being said the the needle we try to thread is have that in there is like a cool unique ingredient have someone be able to quote unquote double click on it in other yeah. words like turn the wrapper over and there's a little blurb on it right but don't alienate the folks who A, don't know what it is, B, don't care, yeah. C, don't want to have to think too hard about it, right? Like you want to you want to win over both the consumer who just wants a chocolate sea salt bar as right. well as the consumer who like nerds out on lion's mane. It's so interesting what you said about the names because I think sometimes, yeah, sometimes, you know, we, we're here in LA, sometimes we can get into like a little bit of an echo chamber, right? Like everybody's having having the poetic esoteric drinks and foods and you kind of forget almost that like, yeah, that's not, most people are not eating or drinking things that, that sound like that. It doesn't take a rocket science to know that people recognize the word chocolate more than cacao. And uh -huh. there, there's a lot of research you can piggyback off of too. So if you look at what are the leading products and out of the hundred leading products, the word cacao is not in a single one of them. Yeah. You, you can, you, but you can approach that two ways. You could say, well, we're going to be the only cacao. That, that's right. Funny. But actually the, the, in my opinion, the better way to approach that is people don't want cacao. Right. <laughs> the, a, they don't know what it is and B, they yeah. don't want it. You can have flavor be your, your differentiator, but that then has to be your differentiator. You can't mm -hmm. be like a brain food bar. Oh, and also we have these quirky, names mm -hmm. and trying to do both those things it's like it's like i said it's, it's just too much you're trying to do nine and ten 
instead of mm-hmm. just eat chocolate sea salt, but also to brain food bar. Did you get that feedback through focus groups? You know, it's the best focus group ever is doing like a sampling or what's called a roadshow at Costco. You you talk to like literally 10,000 consumers because they're just going, there's a constant sea of people passing the group and they'll just tell you, they'll be like, oh, why does it say this? You know, they'll say something in a way where you're like, huh, I guess that is kind of confusing or... Mm. And so, I mean, I I found that to be wildly valuable. Yeah, that's really smart. And I think the Costco tip is a really good one. By the way, I'm sure people will disagree with me on on a number of these, but um, like you don't have to go mass market. I mean, it it all all depends on what your goals are. I mean, Mm -hmm. like you could build a $10 million a year business and just sell in natural grocery, for instance. Like that's not a bad outcome. My goal has always been, how do I get our products into like as many people's hands as possible um, and, and and thus have the biggest impact possible? And to do that, you, ha- you just have to thread that needle and be something someone would pick up at Whole Foods, but also at Walmart or Costco or whatever. Let's switch gears a bit. Do you think it's easier to launch now than it was five years ago? What's made it more difficult? Everything. Things are more expensive. Facebook and Instagram ads are not what they used to be because of iOS's 14.5 change where they make you opt in or or they offer like you have to opt in to be able to give Facebook your data. Thus, targeting got much worse. Thus, customer acquisition costs went right up. Manufacturers are focusing more on uh, less clients, higher volumes. You're not, Mm. you know, a manufacturer that would give you a shot like in 2018 now won't they'd rather just have less customers more more volume per customer. Right. what about the fundraising environment has access to capital become more difficult the reality is investing in a consumer good product in my opinion only really makes sense if you get in early because food brands don't see technology multiples so you have to get in early you have to get in at 2 million to 20 million value. Whereas that's, I mean, heck, some people do take their first money at, at 20 million in, in tech off a of PowerPoint deck. Um, and it can go to a billion or whatever. Yeah. Like that's just not right. happening in consumer goods. The dynamics are different in that way. Um, which, which makes the access to capital cinches it in. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're in a recession. There is a bit of multi- multiple compression, even in consumer goods. It's way less severe than in tech. Um, and people are just more risk averse. So, yeah. so that earlier stage bet is just not happening. It's a similar dynamic to the, to the co-packer thing. Just like they're taking less bets on small brands. So are investors are taking less bets on small brands. Investing period is kind of like dried up. You're seeing some mega deals done, like, yep. um, you know, like Magic Spoon, I think, raised 85 million bucks. Um, Celsius raised, I think, 500 million bucks from Pepsi, et cetera, et cetera. Like mega deals, mm-hmm. but like, because they're de risked, like they're not going away. Um, yeah. So, anyway, long, long winded way of saying access to capital is really tough. You've definitely brought up a lot of great points about the difficulties of both launching and fundraising this environment. Do you see any positives? It's less competitive. You don't have all that artificial money being pumped into the system that's driving up ad costs, for instance. You, the competi- you don't have as many brands competing for the same unit of shelf space. If you truly are like that hungry person, you're not going to have to compete with a bunch of Less hungry people who happen to have been able to raise cash. Speaking of fundraising, you initially raised via crowdfunding. Why did you choose that approach versus traditional venture capital? Valuations in CPG are all based on sales. And if you have no sales, you're going to sell a huge chunk of your business if you want to raise, let's say, 500 grand. Kickstarter kind of helps you solve that problem. Oh, and you, by the way, you need the money to produce the product to then get those sales. So how right. are you going to like right, square right. that circle? Yep. So Kickstarter kind of helps you do that because it's pre-sales. 
get revenue in and you don't have to make the stuff to sell the people, but those are real sales. You book those as sales. So you can do a Kickstarter, it's a, which this is what we did. We sold 75 grand on Kickstarter, another 15 grand on Indiegogo. So 90 K total. Cool. We have 90 grand of sales. We didn't have to outlay any cash. That's very interesting. What about your network? How did you leverage your network to make the Kickstarter work? So I did some crazy, crazy things to make the Kickstarter work. So at Harvard Library, there are these things called Red Books. And I went into the library. And, uh, so in the Red Book is, which is kind of crazy, is every, you pick up 1977, class of 1977, every person in that class's name, email address, phone number wow. is is there, right? Yeah. And so I would just flip through and take photos and, then, <laughs> and I use fo- uh, photo to text uh, conversion software yeah. and then scraped all the email addresses out of all of them. And I think I got like 10,000. I went like everything through like class of 1990 through 2017, I think. Then I got a, I knew a guy who went to Harvard business school and <laughs> he, he, gave me his login and I went in and and the Harvard business school convention is like, you know, everyone has the same format. So it's mm. like, will dot it's a, at HBS 2020, whatever, like sure. there's the same yeah. convention yeah. for everyone. Right. And so I really just needed their first and last name to be able to just create some very basic Excel logic concatenating things mm. and add, adding things. And, um, and through the like search functionality, I just did every permutation of like in like uh, uh, filters. So it'd be like, was in the tennis club. Cool, that gets you a list of people. Of course, it cuts you off, right? So it'll only deliver you the first hundred results. But if you keep doing every permutation, you can like get to like ninety plus percent of anyone who's ever gone to Harvard Business School. And yeah, MailChimp, of course, it's completely against their terms of service. We were just ruthlessly spammed these lists. We got kicked off MailChimp. We were like, oh, what? We didn't know, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then they like reinstated us and then we just went right back to doing it. And then we got kicked off again. And by then we had already like hit up everyone. And yeah, that drove like tens of thousands of dollars in, in Kickstarter backing. And I did the same thing with my wife went to BU. So I scraped the BU alumni. I like, I was like ruthless. Like I did it yeah. for like my high school. Wow. Um, You're I like anybody did... who knows me is. Yeah. Is and then, about and then this. Yeah. it's like a semi warm intro. You're like, Hey, I right. was like, in a, I was class of whatever. Like yeah. it would mean the world if you check out this project, you know? So it's that one little hook of familiarity is enough. Yeah. To where it's like, oh, it's not a complete stranger. So, and then, yeah, there's this other tool used where you can get people to pre-commit posts. So I forget what it was called. It was called like Nouncy or something. I forget what it was called. But so I would get, I would hit you up and say, hey, Penny, um, will you donate a post? Which just means Uh like you press a button and then I can post as you on your Facebook and Twitter oh, wow. and LinkedIn whenever I want. That's amazing. Whenever I want. So it would be like, hey, check out my friend Will's Kickstarter campaign, yeah. right? So I'd, and then I did that to like thousands of people such that when the campaign launched, I clicked a button and it flooded right. every every social network. Of wow. course, the goal, if you do it at enough scale, you can get like trending on Twitter and things like that. We didn't We didn't get to that level, but... But still, it would be like as if you posted say, right, right. on that same time. And then everyone's feed would have like five of them, you know, because everyone's connected to the same people. So they'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, like I'll check yeah. it out. So anyway, those are all free. Everything I just described, I didn't spend a dollar on any of it, right? So that that's kind of yeah. like the beauty just of- Just your blood, sweat, and tears uh, yeah. concatenating Excel and emailing people. Yeah. Will, that's a great story and approach. I want to take a step back for a minute and talk about motivation. What was your motivation for launching IQ Bar? And what advice would you give to founders who are just starting out? Sort of determine what motivates you. Is it fear? Is it 
trying to get adoration of your parents? Is it whatever it is? What, what is that thing that will like, you know, will force you into like some direction you want to go mm-hmm. and then just like use that as, as fuel. Um, so for me, it was like, I quit my job. Like there's no, there's no other path, but to succeed. And like, unless I do everything I possibly could do to succeed, I will just feel like an abject failure. How are you, how are you thinking about planning for the next couple of years uh, as we go into economic downturn? The, the thing about downturns is it's like, if you only have, let's say like 5% penetration into the marketplace, it matters that there's a downturn, but not nearly as much as if you were, I don't know, Cliff Bar or yeah. Oreos or whatever. Right. Then you're everywhere and it's like, oh crap, demand is down across the board. Yep. How do I grow? Whereas if you're like only 5% penetrated, well, just there's still another 95% downturn or, or otherwise, like mm-hmm. go go grab that market share. You can still grow leaps and bounds even in a recession. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't like, I don't factor that piece into it too much. Okay. Um, you know, it's, I don't not think about it. You have to hit a great price point. You have to deliver great value. You have to be recession proof in, in a variety of other ways, but does it mean we can't grow? No. Or does it even really change our strategy of growth? No. I think there's been a distinct shift from like channel focus to a sort of mandate for brands like ours to be omni-channel in 2022, yep. mm-hmm. three, four, et cetera. Because if you're not, you're screwed in some ways. Like if you're D to C only right. a- and you acquire customers for X and then Y external variable happens and now you're acquiring customers for Z, like what are you going to do? I mean, your whole model's busted. Whereas if you do DTC and you're also on Amazon, you're also in brick and mortar and you sell internationally and you have a, yeah. food, a pretty healthy food service business. And well, okay. Yeah. Like that, that's unfortunate that that element dinged your DTC economics, uh, but it's not going to, not going to take your business down. It, it was very in vogue to be super, super focused channel wise and more specifically super in vogue to be DTC only. And and I think it's just not in vogue anymore. Now everyone sort of recognizes like if you want to build a durable brand, you, you almost have to go omni channel. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I completely agree with you. In today's environment, a DTC only model is not sustainable. And brands that operate solely as DTC are limiting their growth potential. I want to quickly talk about your long term vision. You recently expanded your product portfolio into hydration mixes. How does that align with your long-term vision for IQ Bar? What other products are you thinking about launching in the future? Our goal is to be a platform, like we're, we're developing a coffee product. So, okay, morning, like caffeinate, obviously uh-huh. relevant to the brain, gets your brain started, kind of a ritual, morning coffee, etc. That's an occasion we want to play in. Satiation. I'm hungry at 2 p.m. I want a snack. I want it to be filling, have some sort of functional benefits for me. Cool. That's, that's bar. Hydration could be working out, could just be sitting at your desk. Being hydrated is a critical component of brain and body function. Literally can't think as well if you're dehydrated. When you work out, you sweat out electrolytes. You need those. So cool. Hydration. We want to play there. Um, I think even like long, long term sleep. I mean, sleep is uh-huh. so. Um, people are nerding out on sleep way more than they used to. Um, and the sleep category is kind of exploding. Yeah. Admittedly, it's, it's a much more commoditized space. Like basically everyone uses melatonin. So there's less like room for innovation and differentiation. There's a variety of other challenges too. People are really into gummies, gummy, gummy manufacturing is insanely tough. There's only a couple big manufacturers of it. Anyway, long term, like the vision is let's play in all these categories and let's be a brand where a consumer can consume like four different product lines in the same day and be happy with that. They're not cannibalizing each Mm. other. I'm curious, in your day to day, are you paying attention to the activity within the CPG M&A market? I'm always paying attention to the M&A markets and um, 
Mostly what you're seeing are these like mega deals. So I think that is an open question. Will brands only want to be doing these mega deals or will there be sort of mid-market deals? But the small scale deals are kind of like fire sale-y. You know, you're not seeing big multiples. So yeah, it's, it's good to have a healthy M&A market. But does it change how we operate our business? Not all that much, to be honest with you. Well, this is our last question. And we asked this question of all our guests. What business or philosophical principles drive you on a daily basis as a founder? I think of things in terms of like micro goals. Mm. Um, so like, what do I want to be able to accomplish by December 31? And all my energy is in like that sprint. Mm. I guess a, a, good, a better way of putting it is like operate in sprints and don't yeah. try to project out too far. Make sure you nail that sprint. And then high five everyone and then refocus around the next sprint. Right. And then 10 sprints later, later you, you realize like, whoa, business is transformed. Um, I think, you, I think taking too macro of a, of a time horizon lens is just kind of daunting and, and also is in many ways a waste of emotional and psychological bandwidth because shit changes. Like, yeah. COVID happens and supply chains happen and iOS 14.5 happens and yada, yada, yada. So put, put one foot in front of the other. I really like that sentiment. It's a great way to think about it. Set short-term goals and celebrate the small wins. It's really important, but I feel like not everyone does that. Well, thanks again for joining us. It was great to meet you and great to learn more about you and IQ Bar. Good luck with everything in the future and we look forward to following your success. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. This concludes our interview with Will Nitsa from IQ Bar. Thank you all for listening. Please subscribe for more episodes of Consumer Rundown Podcast and visit us at consumerrundown.com. See you next time. <laughs>